Section zero of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt, with preface and two additional chapters by Ford Maddox Heffer. Reader's note, this was the surname of the novelist later known as Ford Maddox Ford. Preface I should call this a very satisfactory book about a country. I mean that at the end of reading it, the reader will have been presented with a certain number of views, and those views square roughly with my own or those of any other man of good will. And any book about a country upon any other lines cannot well be a satisfactory performance. Any man may say, I know my Germany, as any other may say that he knows his London. And he may, indeed, have a knowledge of a country or of a city that is based upon a long residence in the one or the other, and that is fortified by many statistics yet countries, cities, and the hearts of men, a region so wide, or, as it were, streams so profound, that it would appear that there is no man fitted to write a book of a factual kind about any city, any country, or, for the matter of that, about any single human being. For as far as facts go, we have nothing but them to go upon, and facts are selected for us either by blind destiny that will have forced us into certain paths or by our own inborn predilections that set us wandering about a country directed to certain regions by who knows what by the recommendations of friends in search of the footsteps of the dead or by the desire to slake the thirst of our geologists hammers in certain exposed beds of schist Destiny might make you an interpreter situated at Essen, or a British consular representative at Frankfurt. How different would be your views of a country that for me is partly Münster in Westphalia with its dark arcades and its history of blood, and that is still more the Rhine between Koblenz and Asmonshausen, where life lives itself so pleasantly. Essen is all coal, dust, grime, and the resounding of mighty hammers. Frankfurt is all banks, diamonds, gilding, prostitutes, theatres, and art centres. Which, then, is Germany? And could any one soul give you uncoloured facts about both? It is unthinkable. If you live in Frankfurt, you will say that Germany is the most cultured the richest the most practical of all the states you may realize that there is essen where the guns come from or if you live on the rhine you may well say that the german is the gayest the most careless the most musical of pleasant men since ireland has become sober and has cultivated a middle class it is probable that first impressions will color all that you see the one-time consul-general of a southern kingdom assured me solemnly after he had lived for fourteen years in england that england is the most dangerous of all countries on his landing at dover he had come across some three-card trick gentry who had given him a rough time it was the only adventure that ever occurred to him in this country and he felt himself far safer in his own country where the jails are filled with revolutionists and forty men a day are shot in the streets. You will see this irresistible tendency at work in the author of this book. Her first impressions came from Millie of Paderborn, who was, thank goodness, a good Westphalian, an echte Sauerlanderin, and from the good Grimm. So our author is predisposed to like the Germans to look upon them with a friendly and indulgent eye, to find them instinct with all the old Germanic virtues of kindliness, hospitality, modesty, and sobriety. 
you see her first impressions are formed by a germany of the pre-franco-prussian war type god forbid that i should say that these early german pieties have gone out of my countrymen but if i were writing a book about germany i think that i should see first what bismarckism nietzscheism and agnosticism of the auto type have made of the land of the good grim it is also very bewildering and statistics are of no particular good last year i was sitting talking to an imperial forester upon a stump of wood near his first eye he insisted that he had been taught in school that witches and warlocks exist he was a youngish quite intelligent man i said it was impossible that he could have been taught that in a german public school six years ago he said wait and went into his cottage he came out with his school textbook of goethe's faust he turned over the leaves until he came to the scene of walpurgisnacht on the brocken there he said triumphantly yet statistics will prove to you that germany is the best educated land in the world god forbid that i should say that germany is not the best instructed of all lands it probably is though the most looked up to of all modern novelists and thinkers of england of to-day lately assured me that english primary instruction is by a long way the best in the world we must not however say so for fear of the ratepayers he may be right yet as i have elsewhere related i had once a small servant who had just passed the sixth standard in a national school and had just been confirmed she refused to accompany the family to germany for fear if the ship sank in the channel the fishes should eat her soul so you have here a book of impressions if i did not like it i should not be writing this introduction if i had not very much admired the kindly careless inaccurate and brilliantly precise mind of the author i presume the book would never have been written the blind destiny which watches over these things would never have taken the writer into my beloved country for after all it is my beloved country a year or so ago i should have said that i detested the prussianism of the congeries of nations that germany is then came the agadir affair with its revelation of the inherent financial weakness of the kaiserreich now we have an image of a germany threatened with immense slav empires kingdoms and states but i confess that i should hate the thought that this proud people full of free passions should cease to bulk large in the comedy of the nations i should hate to think that one of the horned golden standards that are borne at the heads of so many regiments and their feet literally make the earth tremble upon the exerzierplätze that one of these amidst the smoke of battle should fall into alien hands the other day over the door of a dormitory in a french barracks i read the words soldiers three standards of your regiment are in the imperial museum at potsdam never forget queer words to read france is the darling of the nations the playboy of the western world to france in the end we all owe everything that in the realm of ideas is worth having and i think that in the bottom of a sentimental heart i should like to see france regain her lost provinces because france has been crestfallen about it and i think all nature loves the swaggerer and hates to see his downfall for in this dreary world there is so little happiness but if france regained its loss germany to make the fairy tale complete must have its place in the sun and great britain must lose nothing either i do not know how that court is going to be gotten to that pint pot anyhow such a book as the desirable alien can do nothing but good 
in the sense of letting people understand each other better. It is better than statistics of armaments, for these can be manoeuvred to prove anything the writer likes, and it is better than the pompous analysis of national trays, better than the analysis of mineral wealths, for it lets us come a little nearer, seeing that there is no such thing as Germany as distinct from England, no such thing as England as distinct from the wide lands from the Rhine to the Elbe. It shows, and that is the note of the modern world, that people are just people, taking tuppenny tram tickets from Ealing to the city or from Ringstrasse to the Domplatz, doing their best to keep their ends up in the struggle of an industrial existence cultivating as best they may the muses upon a little thin oatmeal, thinking precious little or nothing at all about dark machinations for the flinging of troops into either East Anglia or the flat lands behind Borkham. But just people, like you and me, and the man who opens the taxicab door for you on the rank. End of Preface Section one of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one. Introduction. How one becomes an alien. Some persons are, of course, born Germans. Some achieve citizenship of that great and good nation. Others, again, have the honour thrust upon them. And one fine day I found myself in the last category of all, with no reluctance but through no fault of my own, and I took to my new position quite kindly. Even some earth-shaking ceremonies through which I, in common with my nation of origin, had lately passed, did not awaken in me any unpleasant sense of what I was forfeiting in the exchange. King George was no king of mine, though he was doubtless to prove a very agreeable king to live under. So it appeared to me on that particular day in June, as I sat at ease on a deal bench covered with red bays built right under the statue of Disraeli, another alien, whom one half of the English nation at least regards as eminently desirable, and surveyed the new King of England's acclaimed and gracious progress through the capital of his lieges. Everything all round me was fairly, oddly, almost Germanly managed. And that reminded me of the folk tale now quite embedded in the English popular consciousness of the oysters and the carpenters. The white roads shone in the sun, the hoardings were painted in chaste, linear, stenciled patterns, the usually dirty buildings above, where no hoardings could reach, seemed polished. But King George's police had contrived to arrange matters so beautifully they had taken such care that everybody should see the procession in safety, that in the end there was hardly anybody there to see it. The whole thing was a triumph of order. But where were the ordered? The streets were cleared for the people who were cleared away. Just a week before the ceremony of the coronation, I had marched along with 40,000 English women along the streets of this alien capital clamouring peacefully constitutionally for the gift of the vote and my legs still ached at the mere thought of those five hours stringent exercise but i now realised suddenly the fact that when the vote was won i as an alien would never walk on those same legs to the pole along with my fellow workers for i had chosen to belong to a country where women do not even dream of emancipation a country where the wife's income, though not her capital, belongs to her husband, and where that husband may divorce her willy-nilly, if she should even so much as insist on wearing colours that happen to jar on him. I brooded over all the privileges which I had forgone as I sat appropriately enough on the English foreign office seats among other desirable aliens, or as some people would prefer to phrase it with John Ruskin among, quote, persons of a certain order in the abyss. 
for cheap patriotism may run to such forms of ignorant depreciation i remember the noble rage of the french father of a friend of mine who had married an englishman as he recounted to me long afterwards his son-in-law's grudging appreciation of papa very intelligent for an englishman shortly before he had informed me that clever was the word for human beings but that intelligent could only be used of animals yet these good people collected with me on the foreign office stand were mostly foreign all of them well dressed and presumably quite intelligent they were by no means downhearted or in the least out of it for salutes were continually passing between the un-english occupants of these benches and the equally un-english occupants of the state carriages i saw my grand duke the boss of my particular province drive by with his grand duchess footnote my august sovereign ernst ludwig Großherzog von hessen darmstadt und bei rhein was i don't know why the only sovereign prince present at the coronation of king george v it is that is to say considered a solecism to allow any crowned sovereign to be present at this ceremony because he must take precedence of the british sovereign as yet uncrowned why therefore one of the grand dukes of hessen darmstadt should have been present i do not know for certainly they do not take rank below any of the other confederate princes of the german empire j l f m h readers note the initials j l f m h at the end of the footnotes refer to joseph leopold the name given by the author to her partner followed by the initials of his actual name ford maddox heffer in footnote i saw my grand duke the boss of my particular province drive by with his grand duchess in her own principality so i am told by joseph leopold his name is a name of awe here he is apt to get casually designated as a german princeling or some serenity or other but he is certainly excessively intelligent and his grand duchess as narrow and conventional as the most straight-laced duchess of the dukeries while well, moreover she of hessen darmstadt has a good deal more control of les moeurs in her department and possibility of asserting her wishes in fact she has the powers of a queen consort in the distance did i but raise my eyes i could see the chimneys of my embassy and in the road below smart officers of my nationality rode abreast wearing the handsome uniform of prussia but thank god i am advised to thank god i need not call myself a prussian though perforce the kaiser a sacred prussian has constituted himself my first warlord all this added immensely to the significance of the procession I found it hardly possible to be quite frivolous in the face of the tremendous vault farce that I have made. The signs, the symptoms of it were all in the air on that English fate day. It remains intangible, mostly made up of symbols and change of symbols, but it gives one to think. Artists are supposed to have less sense of nationality, less patriotism, if you like to put it so, than other people and i hope i am an artist anything to excuse my lack of sense of empire i am sure i should duly say in a crisis my country right or wrong and i am glad to think that i did not flaunt my pro boredom during the war any more than i would choose to swap horses in the middle of the stream but in times of peace i am only too ready to say that my country is in the wrong and I do not think that the Germans, therefore, got a very good bargain in me. Yet my Tedescan sympathies were fairly developed. The process was begun by my father and mother, with prophetic insight, perhaps, from my earliest years. German nurses cuffed me and hushed me in my wicked and virtuous moods, respectively, till I knew their language a good deal better than my own and an order to be respected and duly carried out had to be given to me in german a german nurse from paderborn called milly 
tried to implant in me and my sisters, I fancy, the first glimmerings of that meticulous attention to detail, that respect for the printed word, that habit of patient martyrdom to authority which I consider distinguishes Millie's fellow countrymen and women. Even when later I had a French nurse, she was only a German in disguise, and had been turned out of Paris, sent away by the last train, as a spy at the beginning of the siege. My Germanhood was obviously fate. The cook was in the habit of sending up three lightly boiled eggs for the nursery breakfast. Milly then arranged my two sisters and myself in a row at stated distances from where she sat in the middle, with her spoon, like a nest full of young ravens or a posse of young calves, this careful woman fed us. She took the three eggs seriatim, putting a portion into each little open mouth in rotation, beginning with the eldest. It was as much as our places were worth to murmur. And that is how, now that I have come to years of discretion, I understand why the German system of state insurance, which is the model for the one that has been set up amid tears in England, came to be so patiently tolerated years ago in Germany. For in so slight a matter as the degustation of three eggs, Three free-born English children were aligned, tabulated, fitted into system, and we rebelled far less than I have seen a troop of calves do, fed in the same arbitrary way on pails full of skim milk. Once, and once only, at the age of four, I rebelled against some other of Millie's petty laws of the nursery. I called her a nasty cat. Germans hate cats, and Millie felt it deeply. But no nursery rights or privilege, equally systematised they were too, were mine, until at the end of three days I begged Millie's august pardon. Nowadays I should not hesitate so long as that, especially with a German, for as often as I come right up against this highly organised and quite arbitrary system, do I realise that in willing or even sulky subordination lies the German strength and in the studied ignoring of the claims of the unit we are to read the sense of citizenship. In England, every man's house is and must remain his castle, where he may practice any abomination he pleases, even child torture, so long as screams are not heard outside and thus warrant an officer of the SPCC in entering. The roadway is also free to all, and the soil and gravel which is on it. Witness the following illustration. I lived, when in London, on a hill that is the curse of horses in the winter months. A reluctant vestry, much plagued of its more philanthropic representatives, was at last persuaded to dump down some sand in the slipperiest places for the use of considerate carters. A German vestry would do this as a matter of course, and no German child would be so lost to all civic feeling as to make these heaps of sand into a jumping ground. In England, it was beaten in throughout the whole day by hundreds of little feet and trodden into a hard, unmalleable crust, so that the wagoners in their need were too lazy to break it up, to scatter under the labouring hoofs of their horses. Besides, they had no spades. They would have had spades in Germany. And no German policeman would in the first instance have allowed children to make havoc of these heaps in Germany. Germans seem to me to think of everything, to know everything collectively, and yet to trust no single person individually to do either. On the front of every post box, these Alvissend warn themselves to look carefully before posting a letter to see whether it bears a stamp or not and whether the sender is even omitted to put the address. Away to one of the tiniest of station waiting rooms represents amusement coupled with instruction. You can learn your duties as a travelling showman, also how many live lions you are allowed to travel with to a given spot. Do many people want to travel with dead ones? You may learn that it is forbidden to give theatrical performances at all in a waiting room, place bicycles on the refreshment room tables, 
or carry trees across the line. The German character reminds me of the brown bread ice, once fashionable as a ball supper refreshment. Poetry and prose are in it most oddly commingled. The romantic side of my own nature seems to me to derive from and to been fed by an early and concentrated study of the great Kinder und Hausmärchen of the Brothers Grimm. I remember the winter's evening when the book was first brought into our nursery. The leaping firelight, the strange patterns made by the high nursery fender on the ceiling, the proud, pleased face of Milly. The first story that was read to us out of that ugly red and gold and blue volume published by Edmund Routledge was The Woodcutter's Child. And from that moment, Jack the Giant Killer, even Beauty and the Beast, were forgotten. Savage, unromantic, incomplete, they now seemed. On the second night, we read the weirdest story of all, not a child story by any means. Oh, if I could but shiver! It was horrible, grotesque, up to the final incident, when the beautiful high-born princess pours the pail full of little fishes down the naked back of the man, who shivered then, and not till then. Yet we children found romance in it, found dim, unearthly terrors that made us fall silent, and our eyes grow round, so that after that night the story was tabooed by our elders, who would never consent to read it aloud to us again. Milly herself said it was vulgar. As one grew older, one was promoted to the study of the more actual legendary conte of the Deutsche Sagen. This, the second collection of the Brothers Grimm, concerns itself more with certain semi-historical personages. Graf this, Count that, who when at home and, as one might say, thoroughly domesticated, represent really that superior thief called in German legend the robber baron. It is really he who twice a day is in the habit of descending from his schloss on the steep to rob the merchant whom he is able to perceive from his fastness travelling timorously along the valley below. It is also he who, on pleasure bent, not business, descends to hunt, to fish, to flirt with the nixes of the stream, or with some snaky melusine or lady of the fountain. Great families, so Grimm says, have sprung from such alliances. Grimm tells us also of the humble sort of nix who goes to market, fondly hoping to pass her pretty self off for a proper German maiden. She is, alas, soon recognised by the water that drips from the corner of her apron. The church, the schloss, the stream, the little self-contained dwarf with its houses drawn up close for company, figure in all the tales. And so do the deep, dark, puzzling woods that lie so near, into which children may stray, and whence wild beasts issue, of which nothing is known, and all is feared. I have never seen woods like those of Germany, where one hears the screech of the wildcat in the daytime as the light grows lower, where the very toadstools have an unnatural colour, and the fairy plant clusters on every bough. Do not Jorinda and Joringel still wander there looking for fern seed, and does not the crooked twisted witch, jealous of so much happiness, lurk and peer, desirous to turn each young lover into a bird? and add him then and there to the collection of birds of all sorts in cages that fill her cottage. The value of birds in Germany is made apparent in nearly every story. They say that one reason why Germans more or less detest the French is because that fervently gastronomic nation prefers little birds simmering in the pot to little birds singing in cages. And that is also why there are so few cats in Germany. I have seen them now, those woods, those streams, those castles that I used as a little child to read about, carried away, entranced, sitting in the hard window seat overlooking a stony, regular London street. And I was quite ready for that summer morning about seven when, 
Rising from my berth uncalled alone, I leapt to the little window of my cabin on the Rhine boat and saw in the golden morning light a panorama slowly passing before my eyes that beggared my English dreams of Thames and Ouse. It seemed as if this wonderful sight, like a picture hung on a wall in a lonely gallery, had waited, calm, indifferent, careless of its effect, through all the years for the unexpectant eyes of me and my like to rest upon. It was one long, fair procession of castled heights, each tipped with its little heap of broken stones that once meant so much, clad in the soft foliage masking the proud decay underneath, as it were a cloak of green mantling the ragged fireplaces and deficient cornerstones of the broken robber stronghold. The charitable green led the eye of the beholder gently away, and down to the edge of the water that ran along evenly, its great dark dull flow delving into the scarped banks, with light ripples breaking up the darkness near the middle, whereon I was borne slowly along in my quiet sleeping boat. Nobody minded, nobody seemed to wake but I. We were all on our way to Mainz, some business or pleasure intent. We were all Germans, the proud possessors of this unique waterway. Yet to one so recently enrolled in these civic benefits as I, it was a sight for tears in its gentle, passionless dignity. This view that was vouchsafed to me out of my little square porthole, straight on to romance. For the Rhine is surely the most romantic thing in the world. The Rhine has everything. It is wide. It has cliffs on both sides, like a canyon. And it is so deep, so dreadfully, awfully deep all the time. And there are holes deeper still that are the dungeons of the Lorelei. The full, broad smile of its treacherous shallows masks them. Little innocent ripples only betray the death that attends the lure of the sweet song wafted over the water. And though the authorities have for utilitarian purposes blasted away the foot of her rock, the Lorelei is still there and Germans know it well. For Heine's lyric enshrined her in the German consciousness forever. Hats go off as we pass the jutting promontory whence by her voice she once charmed the hapless fisherman to his doom. And if in these modern days she no longer sings her song for herself, it is sung for her in full and lusty yet soft chorale by the sons and daughters of Heine's Germany. We fare on. The great cliffs on both sides of the stream, with their full rows of vines crawling up to the summit, are hung before our eyes like an oppressive dream curtain. Right back, on the tops of the hills, out of our sight who drift on the stream below, stretch the woods of the Eiffel, one of the great silent forests of Germany. Horribly deadly still they are, devoid of the prattle of birds, undisturbed in their sinister peace the whole day long, except for the rustle of the innocent deer and the more violent crash of the wild boars, plunging through the thickets on their way to drink. The woods, says Joseph Leopold, are silent, because there are hardly any birds. Another reason for the value set on them. There is not enough water for these little creatures, of which Germans are so passionately fond, and it is a long way to fly down to the Rhine for every mouthful of moisture. Yes, a bird is a creature around which the popular imagination readily fastens. Back, back they stretch, these terrible, mysterious, unblessed wildernesses. Terrible, for all the beasts of legend may and do lurk in their secret recesses. And the stalwart forester in his lovely green and grey uniform, with his distant air of undefined yet limitless authority, is king. Good note. This official, who may be royal, imperial, royal, princely, or merely the officer of a private domain, as who should say a private policeman, leads at times a life of sufficient danger, though witches may be absent from the vast tracts of forest over which he rules. The German poacher and the German wood-thief, who will chop down and carry off in a night from one to ten fir-trees, 
or half as many wild boars or fallow deer is a person far more bloodthirsty and determined than any of his confreres of the english woodlands even near the large manufacturing towns it is a pretty comment upon the predilection displayed by our author in common with every other writer upon german characteristics for enlarging on the orderliness and respect for law that she imagines herself to perceive in the german nation that the percentage of crimes of violence is higher than any other country in the world with the sole exception of the united states that germany is the most heavily policed nation in the world the forty per cent of the crimes of violence are committed against policemen foresters postmen who are robbed and murdered in the solitary and romantic woodlands with a lamentable frequency and by an odd collocation of psychology against firemen the firemen in germany is almost as detested as the policeman i can only imagine because he is a state official wearing a uniform when a village near st gorshausen was being burned to the ground i saw the peasant inhabitants turn out in a body and stone the firemen that came galloping up along the rhine it was true that this was attributable rather to a desire to collect the insurance money than to any immediate dislike of the firemen but such a proceeding cannot be held to argue any strong respect for either law or order the fact is that every non-official german detests or despises every german official in so far as his office is concerned of course in varying degrees he abides by laws and regulations because he will be fined with unerring swiftness or imprisoned after a trial of excruciating slowness if he breaks the one or neglects the other he is in fact not so much law-abiding as kept under by laws j l f m h end footnote and the stalwart forester in his lovely green and grey uniform with his distant air of undefined yet limitless authority is king whom and what does he not govern beasts of course and who knows what undisciplined humanity what savage robbers and ladies like schinderhannes their picturesque accomplice he may not meet in his day-long wanderings in this silence this sameness and vastness one has a feeling that anything everything might happen that the mild blue-eyed woodcutters and charcoal burners of whom you may meet a sample or two in the course of a long day's walk may have grown strangely morbid in this perverting solitude and be disposed to make a bad use of their unsermoned liberty and the great populous indifferent waterway glides through these secret and potential mysteries majestically ignoring all save what comes to meet it the wild thirsty creatures that brush and trample down to the bank for water the staple of their life but the stream has nothing to do with the backwoods it threads languidly the countries of enchantment avoiding as it were the thought and oppression of them it must pass on its way to the noisy towns of commerce beyond through this valley of apollyon this sinister passage commanded by the two portals the rock of drachenfels on the one side and rodanseck on the other entering here it passes for a space out of the modern world even the railway running continually like a covert insult under either bank hardly hints modernity it cannot seriously affect a flow so big so black so simple and so deep down in its bed the strong sane morning light only seems to touch the crests of the mountain walls that enclose that river bed these vast mounds of closely packed leaves tipped with castles that hang over it old grey helpless and forlorn the banks look under the glare of the truculent virile shafts of gold that are fostering and ripening the vine screens minute by minute and at night we wandered along the white ghostly vine-bordered road by osmondshausen desiring deeply to see the fox whose smell bereath him actually at his thievish work among the vines the trains rushing along under the opposite bank looked like worms the worm of legend or like rattlesnakes with tails of gold one is almost glad when they have passed and once more all is quiet and the ripple of the rhine assumes again its own predominance 
and the black bank swoops in as before it is not for very long there is a line on both sides of the rhine and very soon on the side where one is walking one is confronted by a dusky mass that seems to have a kind of life advancing with its bulldog breast and body of lighted carriages it too passes rattling by complacently and the scent of the fox that has surely lain there on this patch of grass by the roadside all night comes out strongly again and so after three lazy days of sun and wind and soothing ripple i go gliding into the country of my adoption insinuating myself by these peaceful methods of penetration i am born past Bopart, where sundry squares of linen are waved by charming relations out of villa windows to welcome the desirable alien at rennes with its terrace and ruined tower where a holy roman emperor once met his lieges more charming german relations i get off the boat there for a moment and walk straight into the village kermesse now in full swing and i am heartily invited to dance by a handsome compatriot in full costume but these few alightings on german soil are the merest taking of season during these five days or so i am at home not in germany but upon the steamer i sleep on it i eat on it i travel on it and it is only during the halts to take in cargo that i walk upon the banks so that into germany i have only as yet made the merest swallow flights returning to the safe shelter of england for a ship is always english at least that is the impression that i have though this particular ship happens to be dutch still it isn't german and its cooking is as bad as anything that could be found in england in the circumstances of my adieu to my native land this fact seems to be consoling and protective at Asmanshausen there are a great many hotels the sun is setting the vineyards up the steep hills are blood red and when i step off here it is all over with me for here upon the bank there stand the nearest relations of all they are going to induct me into the sacred and mysterious rites of german citizenship and don't they do it for they conduct the literary lady to the literary hotel advertised as such before i may sit down to eat rhine salmon and drink rhine wine i must visit the freilichrat room an omission on my part to gaze fasting on the apartment where one of german's lyric poets stayed several summers and drank let us say nine hundred bottles of rhine wine will be a sign of the grossest disrespect unpermissible even in a tired alien what poet in england could draw us up to his room before we have washed the stain of travel from us and before we have dined but this is the bank of the rhine this is germany and as i sit upon the hotel balcony and look out at the silver expanse of the stream the lights upon the farther bank the deep purple of the high woods and the thin pairing of a new moon that seems since i did not happen to see it first through the glass of any window to offer me the good luck of germany suddenly it comes into my head that when after a little travelling across this broad land i again set foot upon the gangway of a ship and when i am asked are you a british subject i shall have to answer no because i have tasted of these grapes drunk of this wine and heard the flow of this of the river when i return to my native land i shall be an i trust desirable alien end of chapter one Section two of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two Harem Skirts, Storks, and Some Social Amenities. The Rhine is all very well, but the Rhine is the heritage of all the nations. I had said to Joseph Leopold that I could never feel truly German unless I had lived, positively lived, watched him pay rates and taxes 
in a German town with no topographical features or historical associations of any sort wherewith to attract tourists, and had lived in a house taken in our own name, where there should be, moreover, a correct family of storks domiciled on the roof. So accordingly, one night in May, I crossed back from England, where I had had business, and towards the evening of the second day alighted on the platform of no particular town in the Grand Duchy of Hessen-Darmstadt, where Joseph Leopold and his mother, already settled in the house where the stork, as I hoped was also settled, were waiting to receive me. I had spent a night in Cologne in a very gorgeous hotel that was not so very dear. It is difficult to take much interest in Cologne. It is so emphatically only a place to kick off from, a place where you take the train to the interior, buy Tauschnitz volumes, and go to see the dome, that triumph of steeplejacks. I had done a little more. After paying my respects at the post office, which is like a palace, I went all round the city in a tram, and I was taken to the theatre in the evening to see a musical comedy in the most beautiful drawing-room that ever called itself a theatre, and was quite cheap. Next morning I got into my train, and it was like any other railway journey, only I was sitting in an exquisitely groomed railway carriage fitted with all sorts of sensible, comfort-loving apparatus, provided for its sensible, comfort-loving people. If I had wished it, the Art Nouveau dun velvet coloured seats would have pulled out to make me a bed. In the lavatory I found I could have a cake of good soap and a clean towel to wash and dry my hands. The company demanded merely the slight expenditure of energy on my part that would be involved in the insertion of ten pfennigs in the slot machine. I did so, and according to promise, the obliging machine politely flung the soap and a clean towel into my face. This was for my body. My mental peace was attended to as well. In the corridor, right opposite my eyes, was a glass-walled cupboard containing, plain to see, a pick and an axe. Supposing an accident should occur in my centre of gravity and that of the compartment I was in came to be inverted, all I had to do was to break the glass take out the pick, and hew myself out. The most nervous traveller might rest tranquil and survey in peace the ordinary sights of a railway line until he should fall asleep. And there was little except this extreme of comfort inside, and the queer legends inscribed on the wagons, grotesque abbreviations of words not realised, like Tragf and Bodenpfl, and a more lugubrious collection of letters, Ladengr, that kept me puzzling till the dusk came and merged everything into the same dreary dream of travel to tell me that I was not journeying along quietly under the evening star in England. H is a junction, so the station is large and imposing for a very moderate-sized town. It looked homely in parts, palatial in others, cheerful everywhere. As I got stiffly out of the carriage and was led by Joseph Leopold and his mother into the big hall of the Bahnhof, I saw that its roof was frescoed with an overarching trellis of flowers, wild flowers, producing very much the same effect as the roof of Boxgrove Priory Church in England. The electric light hung in elegant festoons of pearly globes strung on long cords, like organ pipes of different calibres. And I was tired, and I was hustled into a cab, or I should have peeped into a first-class waiting room, and perhaps into a second-class waiting room, both decorated in the most excellent taste, both with the same flower-painted ceilings and wreathed pillars, the only apparent difference between the first and second class being in the varieties of flowers selected for adornment. If I had had to be fed, instead of waiting till I got home, I should have been given a cheap meal that would not have disgraced the Carlton, the cheapness only being taken out in the quantity. 
a real chef presides over most of the station restaurants in germany and even the railway sandwiches the lark or ham sausage sandwiches you snatch in a hurry are a dream but if you have time to sit down you eat a carefully prepared meal in a decent sort of quiet hall that is above all soothing large artificial roses in pots raise their delicate sprays above the welter of hats and coats instead of the scraggy palms that always seem to have a pointed leaf ready to hit you in the eye and are silhouetted on dark wine-red panelling instead of being repeated in fly-blown gilt mirrors and while you are waiting you need be under no anxiety as to the starting of your train an electric clock serves a large enamelled timetable on the wall, and you are aware of its rapid, subtle change by the unobtrusive click that occurs at intervals over your head. Besides this, an individual in gorgeous garments, with the presence of a high-class butler in an English family of rank, and a voice to match, flings open the restaurant doors every now and then, and announces the fact to you that in five minutes or so you may begin to pay your bill and gather your odds and ends and go out into the business section to find the train for Kassel, for Kirchhain or for Frankfurt, as the case may be, waiting for you. I was taken past the two officials in blue gold-blazed coats who stand on each side of a turnstile furnished with a penny-in-the-slot machine. Both Joseph Leopold and his mother had had to furnish themselves with these penny passes before they could get onto the platform to welcome me. And significant fact, all residents, non-travellers, anxious to avail themselves daily of the really superior cuisine of the Bahnhof, have also always to pass through this turnstile. Supper was waiting for me at home in the house where I confidently expected to find the nest of storks which were to represent Germany for me. The night was very dark and after driving for some time in streets of villas which reminded me of St John's Wood or Addison Road we came to a tall building with scaffold poles girt about it looking ghostly in the lamplight. This is our house joseph leopold remarked it is new very new too new he looked anxiously at me i looked up into the dim empyrean it did not seem as if a nest of storks would find that high-pitched roof an easy platform whereon to bring up a large family but i was patient ate my supper quietly and decided to ask for sight of germany's most prominent features next morning but next morning I saw very plainly why Joseph Leopold had looked nervous. The house, though replete with every modern comfort, did not boast this delightful parasitical growth, and I was told that I should have to take a walk and visit perhaps the old part of H before I saw the German substitute for the homely cabbage which ushers English babies into the world. In my first walk, however, I saw one. I saw two. Going towards Wiesek, a village suburb of H, along the straight, cheerless, treeless road, my eyes lingered on the adjacent moorland where the Hunnengruber are, the graves of buried people who lived before the dawn of all we know. Low, stagnant pools. Footnote. There is nothing like a stagnant pool between the city of H and the village of Wiesek. There are excellently fertile green plains owned by peasant proprietors and scientifically irrigated with running water. J. L. F. M. H. In footnote. Low stagnant pools fringed by gloomy belts of trees of dark despondent grass stretched away under a drooping sky and presently two great birds topped the trees and came sailing towards us across the marshland. They made a strong note of tossing black and white in the sullen greyness, and something majestic in their flight, as of long legs folded and trailing after, struck me, and I said, 
these are the storks I have come so far to see. They are indeed, Joseph Leopold said. They come out of that wood. Footnote. Storks never come out of woods. They never go into them. J. L. F. M. H. N. Footnote. They are the parent birds and have been seeking food. Their nest is probably on the roof of one of those houses. Let us watch and see where they go. They flew straight for the twisted, crooked, tiled roof of a house nearby. It was the village inn. They settled and stayed there. I could just make out their unwieldy forms nestled under the high red chimney stack. And we went on and surveyed the village too. An old place that stood there long before the modern industrial suburb, which is now the city of H, while Wieseck, the old notice, had fallen to the rank of a village in the outskirts. The inn was quite comfortable and modernised inside. Extremes meet in Germany, and the roof that shelters the stork is also wired for electric light. The telephone bell rings in the Weinstube, where bloused peasants sit and spill their wine on the trestled table. And men who have never worn evening dress except at a wedding or a civic ceremony, and whose wives would think it shame to go décolleté, read the works of John Goldsworthy and H. G. Wells. So I found, when I began to return and pay calls. One of the first questions that Mutterschen on my arrival had asked me was, Have you got it with you? She meant my harem skirt that Joseph Leopold had begged me to buy and bring. The harem skirt was a beautiful outdoors fashion, killed by too zealous advertising. Enterprising advertising agents suddenly let loose a whole troop of lovely women to do a goose step in the gutters of London town and Paris town, wearing a costume as sensible as it is beautiful, and short-sightedly welcomed the émeute thus caused. For when their object of mild advertisement was gained, they were unable to say to the sea of comment and criticism whose onset they had provoked, thus far, and no farther. They overshot the mark. The police found themselves interfered with in their functions, and the harem skirt is now dead as a doornail. It is no longer outré. It is worse. It is old-fashioned. The papers allude to it as meteoric. And yet it was a mode that fashion should not willingly have let die. As a walking costume it was ideal. And short, stumpy women, who do not look well in short, round skirts, should have cloven to it. It was length without breadth, heroism without risk, a long garment that needed no holding up and did not flop and collect round the ankles. Soon after my arrival in H, to please Joseph Leopold and his mother, I put it on and went forth to pay a call. No, it was not a real call. Real calls in Germany are paid between the hours of twelve and one, or five and seven. It was going out to tea in a friendly way. I had promised to show Frau Rexanwald B. and her husband the famous Hosen Rock of which they had heard so much actually in where. These dear people were all agog to see it. They had seen representations of it in the illustrated papers, and read of it in the accounts of police court trials for disturbances, but they had not seen it as I have, travestied on the cinematograph for the very simple reason that respectable German people of a certain class do not patronise the cinematograph. The Herr Rexanwald was going to get away early from business to see it. A Prussian major, whom I'd seen in uniform posturing about the town on a fat white schimmel, was coming to tea to see it, and Joseph Leopold and his mother were coming to chaperone it. The Frau Rexanwald B. lived just across the street and a little way along, past the barber's and the boot shop, in a distracting new white flat with overhanging balconies. Joseph Leopold and his mother walked one on either side of me, 
apprehendingly but not insultingly near. I got across alive. I flattered myself that my quiet, unnoticeable, dark blue serge, banner-like flaps, covering the innocentest of dark blue silk trousers, representing as they did the subtlest possible evading of the necessary bifurcation, would pass as the ordinary skimped skirt of the year. By the way, I thought scornfully, remembering the stampedes I had seen some few months ago in England, what a fuss to make about a woman putting each leg into a separate trouser, when the present accepted fashion is tantamount to her getting both legs into one. I went across walking with an ease and freedom I have never known in any other costume, and up Fra B's easy, broad oak, uncarpeted staircase, and quite unabashed, for there is really nothing in it but a woman walking as comfortably and unobtrusively as a man for the first time in her life, into this German drawing-room, with the tea spread in the dining-room on which the wide folding doors were thrown open. I saw that it was going to be what one remembers as an old-fashioned English sit-down tea. Not a stout tea, for there was nothing on the table but the ordinary give-and-take of thin tea with cake and bread and butter handed round in cake stands, but we all sat down. And I seem to remember that we had dainty napkins. It's nothing my hostess declared when the first shock was over and cake handed. I shouldn't have known, unless you had told me beforehand. Her husband was silent. He was a lawyer, and might possibly have seen me crossing the street. He probably already saw the police of his native town politely requesting me to desist from giving the natives of H food for reflection and so indeed it proved. The Prussian officer, a man of few words, literally of few words, for I have now known him long, both in Germany and England, and I have never heard him say anything but softly, huskily, seductively on first meeting you, wie geht's Ihnen? The Prussian officer sat at my side, and at intervals murmured sweetly more to himself than to me, Hosenrock. He reminded me of Coquelin in Landessy, murmuring the name of the beloved. C'est comme du sucre dans la bouche. And all the while, as far as was consistent with the recurrent effort to be polite in Germany and accept cake and pass cake in that almost unknown language, appalling at first, but later a matter which it seems to me can be settled fairly adequately by sprinkling one's conversation with civil expletives and flinging bitters about freely, I was allowing my eyes to wander about the room, and wondering why, though it looked different, it yet looked like somewhere in England. And at last I decided that it reminded me of a tea party that I once went to in Birmingham with some relations, who had a suggestion of Quakerdom about them. It was the furniture the self-embroidered hangings, the saddle-bag chairs interspersed with cane or wicker ones, the pictures on the wall that looked like chromolithographs. I dared to say that for a fact, but I think they were. Good no. They were really oil paintings also from the hand of the accomplished hostess, J. L. F. M. H. N. Footnote. And had I come all the way into Hesher to look at Lancy's Deer at Bay, or the mantel borders fringing adequately the wood and glass affair looking like a model of a new church that was erected over the fireplace, and the art plates transfixed pilloried on the walls, painted with portraits of members of the hostess's family by the hostess herself. And my hostess was what would be called a notable woman in England, because she managed her house admirably and did so many other things besides. In Germany, she was just ordinary. Her very blouse was embroidered hieratically, wherever embroidery would lie by her own fair hands. I found myself staring covertly at the strange mythological figures, 
complicated and interwoven with what antiquaries describe as the gothic worm twist that had been pressed into the service of decorating the bosom of this dear little hausfrau germans are still in matters of decoration wallowing in the aesthetic craze the strange modification of pre-raphaelitism which insinuated itself into the middle-class consciousness and onto the walls and decorations of their houses under the unconscious impetus of oscar wilde and methinks that practicality and aestheticism make an odd mixture the master of the house with his fine head and sensitive intelligent mouth was very like some early portraits of napoleon paying to my unusual costume polite french compliments he began to talk of shakespeare and the musical glasses this is no old-fashioned figure of speech he betrayed a closer acquaintance with shakespeare than either joseph leopold or i could boast on richard strauss's salome so long interdicted in england was not much more than food for babes to him h g wells john galsworthy etc were household names to this instructed person he was up in their latest works where in birmingham or salford should i have met with this i listened i told him that i personally had had the pleasure of the acquaintance of both these godlike figures he beamed ingenuously and unlike birmingham or salford was not in the least concerned to glean from me personal details of the households and manners and customs of the great english authors Footnote. this of course is very un-german since the average german will read with avidity any details of the life of either goethe or shakespeare and comparatively neglect the poetry of either writer but even in Sodom there may have been one just man. J. L. F. M. H. and footnote. To him they were as recondite, as undiscoverable as Shakespeare, but as potent factors of the intellectual existence of their day as Shakespeare was in his. He needed no details of the private lives of these gentlemen to feed his interest in their work the soft murmur of hossenroch went on frau b made fresh tea with meticulous precision while i no longer felt as if i were in colmore row birmingham and was quite sure that herr b was not responsible for the painted plates but i expect i was wrong i have realized by now that hand-painted plates and real culture can live side by side in germany i say culture advisedly for i consider culture so called to be only education deep and in no way instinctive at least i am sure it may be so in hessen darmstadt my host was educated he had moreover a keen and open mind he could take in ideas he could play with them but he could not so far as i could see originate them it is a far cry from that solid well-organized well-engineered mind of his a mind like a carefully planned house properly architected from the first plan on paper as it were arranged up to date and for the future with every modern convenience plus the powers of expansion necessary for the introduction of new inventions it is a far cry i think to the tricksy moody genius of the englishman or to the alert erratic passion driven one of the frenchman i think the latin mind is like an empty old built on to the house or castle ruined in parts decorated a nouveau in the rest a house in whose corridors you never know whom you may meet whether a ghost or an apache a cid de vent or a socialist End of section two. Section three of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three Sleepy Hollow. 
I think that if one seriously considers, as I have done, the relative genius for domesticity of the three nations, France, Germany and England, one is bound to place France first and England last. My readers will certainly think that I am preparing a laboured epigram, but no, I am deeply serious. In the land of my birth, the sloppy opinion prevails that the English home is the focus of all domestic virtues, that the Englishman's castle, containing the Englishman's fireside, is inexpugnable. Granted England's preeminence in the art of Le Foyer, it is then grudgingly admitted that Germany comes in a good second. But France, the country of restaurants and long collage and Christmas spent in the streets, as among booths and merry-go-rounds at a fair, is supposed to be absolutely innocent of any domestic fibre at all. I who speak have been one way and another considerably at home in the family circles of members of all three nations. I know the free whisky and come in after dinner of England well enough, the after does not spell reserve so much as meanness. And whereas the real German Hausfrau does now and then permit people to drop in, I have only once known a chance visitor admitted into the French family circle, even after dinner. Relations, of course, crop up insufferably enough at all times in France, mostly into one's bedroom, but relations only prove my contention. In England, as we all know, even relations do not invade the Englishman's fireside with impunity. The Englishman, besides, is more or less safe from this form of intrusion, for he is, as a rule, on quite bad terms with at least two-thirds of his relations, and does not acknowledge or candidly ignores the other third. I have seen an Englishman pass his own first cousin in the street, not because he had any grounds of a quarrel with him, but simply because he did not know him. And when pressed, he lazily explained that, through some quite usual circumstance, their ways of life lay apart. I have myself been introduced, at a London dinner party, to a brilliant and popular male cousin, who had been deputed to take me into dinner. My hostess was simply in the hurry and bustle of a London life, unaware of the relationship. Why should she know? She had never met this relation of mine at my house, but she was quite au fait of the people she was in the habit of asking to her dinners. She knew that I was neither Scot nor Jew, and could be counted upon therefore to be easy about family ties. My newfound cousin took me in, and we chatted pleasantly through our allotted span of intercourse, and parted quite good acquaintances. But I have never seen him since. I did not want to. Neither, I suppose, did he care to carry on his acquaintance with me. We were both busy and undomestic people, that is to say, of English extraction, both of us. As I said, in England, in Mayfair, it provoked no comment whatever. But if such a thing could happen in Germany, it would be considered at least a romantic or even disagreeable incident. There would be a suggestion of some story behind. In France, it certainly could not happen at all. No French hostess would have run her head into a noose. She would, before asking me to her house, have made it her business to learn which of my relations I was on good or bad terms with. She would be quite sure that I could not in the nature of things have been, as in the case I have just mentioned, on no terms at all. For instance, once in Paris, at an evening party at the house of Madame Taine, the widow of the historian, I was presented to an old bediamonded vicomtesse bearing a well-known and honoured name of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. I was not thrown at her head, irrespective of consequences, just because I happened to be the nearest person to the seat where she was sitting. Oh no, there was some social reason for my introduction. 
but i was first of all solemnly warned that this old lady was not on terms with her daughter-in-law another vicomtesse of a well-known name this was as well as the daughter-in-law had been in her green youth spent in england a school companion of mine of course madame ten could not have been expected to know that but she took no risks and cleverly saved the situation in advance this was in cosmopolitan paris in the provinces well let me say speaking as one who has sounded the very depths of french provincial life a la balzac that no one who has not done so can have the very slightest idea what it is like you may think of the dullness the impenetrability of it all as you think of the primeval forests of the amazon described by joseph conrad and more recently by h m tomlinson only it is a forest of undistinguished people as like in the main as one ombu tree or one branch of liana to one another there is a waterway through these family trees as there is through the forest depths of the amazon you are perhaps staying at one clearing and you take a car and drive to visit some settlers at another you get out of the car you march up the well-raked over carriage drive leading to the house and ascend the four or five well-tended steps and are introduced into the salon you have no idea as you go in how many families each with separate interests are going to be congregated on the floor of that salon there it is the family or families sitting up on its ugly stiff chairs monsieur home from business he begins work so much earlier than his english confrere that he is well home by the early afternoon grand-mere perhaps and surely a belle-mere or two then the belle fille bored and incomprise with all the household cares taken off her shoulders so that she may the better emotionally attend to her children then there is the engaged couple there is pretty sure to be one engaged couple or more and even the engaged couple must sit intensely chaperoned in the common sitting-room must take a part in the feeble banal conversation that manners prescribe when strangers invade the sanctity of the home these people are undoubtedly educated they are often clever they may even be original but amid this terrible massing of communal interests what individual could let him or herself go to the extent of demonstrating that cleverness or originality it will be too communally dangerous each member of the junta listens to the other and as elsewhere least said soonest mended another feature of this intense domesticity is that the visitor has no means of distinguishing the parentage of all the check bloused and bare-legged and yellow-booted children until the usual incident of play occurs and the baby with the pin that is running into it or the boy who has been giflé by the girl runs stormily crying to its own mother to be as stormily comforted now as to that small point i have never seen a german baby cry like an english or french baby or seen a german mother let herself go in the same hysterical way a german mutterchen one is almost tempted to think is not addicted to the slightly selfish latin passion for her own child there always seems something rather communal about the maternal attitude towards the kinder and german children are not so universally present i suspect that the reason is that although they are not so hysterical or naughty they are rougher more like little animals less presentable in fact you rarely see the children if you go to pay a stiffish call in germany you see the person you have asked to see and perhaps no one else just as you do in england they give you tea just as they do in england the fact that it is a sit-down tea does not stultify and make it formal since the eatables are of the lightest and airiest description 
and uncomplicated by the tedious demands of ravenous little children and the conversation that accompanies the meal if inclined in the provinces to be heavy and unillumined is still conversation the exchange of ideas and individuals may and do assert themselves in argument you pay your more formal calls in the morning and you stay just twenty minutes keeping your card case in your hand you are as stiff yourself as you know how to be and that is not very stiff and then i suppose the worst of that is that they think you are an amiable lunatic on the other hand when it is your turn to sit up and receive calls you think if you have not been properly drilled and informed that the people are exceedingly frigid and disagreeable i could not think why mutterchen who naturally knew the ropes a good deal better than her daughter-in-law seemed so well pleased with the visit of the herr professor and frau professor in c who came one sunshiny morning to pay me a formal call Footnote. it was really a wirkliche geheime regierungsrat and his wife a geborene freifa von o j l f m h end footnote. they sat on the very edge of the city and talked to mutterchen who speaks quite good german i sat beside her keeping my needlework in my hand which i afterwards found i ought not to have done and tried valiantly to add airy ungrammatical nothings to the very vapid conversation that was being held in my honour that was the point yet nobody took up a word i said except mutterchen who seemed all the time on thorns and to be trying politely to bring me into the conversation bad grammar halting sentences and all after a session of exactly twenty minutes the pair rose with a handshake of the stiffest to musician and a curt nod to me the lady of the house i was boiling with rage and said to joseph leopold if this is the way the fatherland welcomes alien brides i think i could have dispensed with the visit of the greatest gun in k as you say he is why the wife snubbed me to death she hardly threw me a word very slowly joseph leopold removed his pipe from his mouth they took you for my mother's companion he said and a very cheeky one at that putting your word in every now and then and going on with your sewing that was a mistake but the whole lamentable incident was joseph leopold's fault for confusing Mutterchen and me in his introduction. Of course, Mutterchen looks ridiculously young. In the afternoon I went to tea with Frau L, and relieved my mind by telling her in bad German all that had befallen me on the occasion of the first visit that had been paid me. I ought to have put myself forward, she said, and put my work away. I had looked too humble. Frau L had been in England, and she realises how different things are there. Then, when the mistake was cleared up, I was asked to a formal café clatch. This is a tea party in England, a five o'clock. Only in Germany it is always at four, and the guests are expected and endeavour to be punctual to the minute. It lasts till seven, and people bring their work. I have attended such parties both in Germany and in Belgium. The ceremonial is very much alike in both countries. I will not attempt to describe one item of the polite procedure, for in every book about Germany you meet a description of that business of the favoured guest and the Sofa Platz. My mother impressed on me when my marriage first took me to Germany. She had been an old resident in my new country that whatever else i did when i first began to go out there was one unpardonable sin and that was to take sofa platz uninvited however as a bride the phrase bitte meine frau wollen sie sofa platz nehmen sounded pretty frequently in my ears the rest of the proceeding surely cannot have altered much since eighteen sixty when my mother cultivated german society at dusseldorf 
In the first place, no men attend, as in England, but, unlike England, men are not expected to attend and are not complained of at every future occasion. There are no teacups to be seen in the drawing-room, but what I should have called a nursery tea, a stout tea, a thick tea, is set out in the dining-room on long tables covered with spotless white tablecloths. The table centre has generally been embroidered or put together by the hostess, in some cases very much as a bird's nest is put together, of the most heterogeneous materials, and it is proper to admire it. The pièces de résistance are one or more great open torte, pastry crusts filled with fruit and jam and schlagzahne whipped cream. The white aproned maids run about handling cups of tea and coffee poured out by the hostess and cream to put in it and sugar. Others dispense the prodigious cakes I have described and any amount of smaller ones to fill up the gaps. That is why there are no gaps in Germans. They are so adequately filled. And the ladies sit for an hour. Then they troop back into the dining room and more needlework is done, and more gossip spoken, and more Zopa Platz business. About half past six, everyone is marshalled back into the dining room for beer. Then home with your useful afternoon stitching, and your violent indigestion, at least for a person not acclimatised. Official dinners, even large family dinners, are very ceremonious, and the food is very good. And instead of getting away from a dinner in time to go on to a dozen routs and receptions and dances, as one does in London in the season, a German hostess expects to entertain you till about four in the morning, or else her party is not counted a success. Such a lot of pounding backwards and forwards to a dining room there seems to be. At least my ideas on these social peripatetics are a little confused. One of my most frequent hostesses had been in England, had stayed with me and my mother there, in fact, and was bitten with the English way of doing things. She especially approved of the English custom of the retiring of the ladies, and this is the way she managed it. The gentlemen rose when the ladies did, and followed them into the drawing-room as usual in Germany, but they did not, in Frau B.'s house, stay with them for the rest of the evening, as the German habit is. Footnote. I should like to point out that this is the normal custom in good French society, where the gentlemen escort the ladies to the salon, and then return to the dining-room for a short interval. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. No, they went back to the dining room and kicked their heels there for a bit, and I dare say they found the innovation very annoying. But Frau B is a determined little person, and the spirit of novelty is working in her. It is usual for the whole party again to troop back to the dining room towards the small hours to consume beer. You never get very far from beer in a German menage. Frau B. has a neighbour, a neighbour who does not care about English habits, but is pushed by her strong spirit of emulation to ostentation and display. She had adopted the plan of giving a bowler at the end of a party, instead of the milder intoxicant of beer. And so Frau B., after her very good dinner, insisted on giving her guests a bowler and a very elaborate burglar, too, which she had compounded herself in the course of the day. Herbie had not expected it, and when the fat, yellowish mixture was produced, looking for all the world like egg julep that I wash my hair with, his face was worth seeing. He knew how strong it was, egg, flip or noggin, with arak in it and a dozen other fierce ingredients. And behold, it was he who suffered. I heard him suffer. Perhaps all the other men suffered, I do not know. I happened to be staying in the bee's house at the time. 
and although I did not see Hebby till late evening of the day following, I am convinced that he nearly died. Poor man! It was not his fault, but Lynchon's. He did not ask for egg flip, only for mild beer. But once it was there, he could not refuse to make himself hospitably ill with the rest. This lusty power of occasional intemperance, and the endurance of its brief condign punishment, is a useful note in the German temperament. Most drunk is soonest cured to vary the common proverb. The continual daily indulgence in luscious and humour-forming foods and drinks is, I really think, the raison d'etre of the Teuton's immense and comprehensive system of summer cours. The Germans' over-greased digestive organs are the counterpart of those of the abstemious, constipated Englishman. It is the moral incommodity of the latter that he is born without any very strong pleasure in eating it is his boast that he can eat anything so long as he can get his teeth through it this is a perfectly true boast and one that suggests great strength of character but unfortunately the true briton cannot also persuade his weak gastric juices to attend at the behest of his strong will and he whose mouth has never watered before he ate has never profited by these tricksy fluids, which are only evoked by the apprehension of the toothsome morsel. Benighted man, he prefers nice plain food, not messed up, as my mother's north country cook phrased it. That is to say, not prepared in a way to provoke the enjoyment that would cause these so recalcitrant juices to flow. On the continent, where the belly is as God, and who shall say unrightfully so, one comes across people who go to the other extreme and overeat themselves. But even these professors of the sin of enormity do not seem to suffer from the permanent indigestion as the ascetic, patient, plain cook written English seem to do. The Englishman of means is, of course, able to visit Coors freely to get rid of his Christian burden of indigestion. Trotting mildly along esplanades and parades, he meets middle-class thrifty Germans, come there likewise to profit by the healing waters of their own land. Does it, however, occur to any of my ancient compatriots to think that in so doing the Teuton is both eating his cake and having it? The Englishman fares to Homburg or Wiesbaden sadly, drearily, to try to modify the results on a poor moral body of a moral regime self-prescribed. The German goes happily, heartily, to be finally and absolutely cured of a plethora of enjoyment, of a year's whole-souled gormandizing. At Homburg or Wiesbaden they meet they walk backwards and forwards for a month or so in company imbibing the dreadful water that tastes and smells like rotten eggs but when all is said and done and digested the foreigner has his three hundred and thirty good dinners to the good and entertaining in germany is not always dinners and overfeeding i have been to many little friendly evenings to which the invitation ran Will you come in to roulette and beauvle? Then, more often than not, the little reunion gives occasion to another kind of excess, or in harmony, perhaps, with our English idiosyncrasy. Germans, many of them, are great gamblers. The German Hausfrau legend dies hard, but I know of two German Fraus who permit to play on these occasions and one who, not possessing a roulette table, allows her friends to bring their own roulette cloth and win her husband's hard-earned money away from him. She sits serene, to outward seeming at least, while as host her man takes the bank, which always in private houses must lose in the end. Footnote. This, of course, is nonsense. 
in german houses the host practically never takes the bank because the bank invariably wins on the evening to which our author more particularly refers the host unfortunately for himself was playing against the bank a modification of the martingale invented by myself which however i never had the courage to put into practice j l f m h end of footnote would the guest who sprang such a mine on a quiet unsuspecting hostess in england ever be asked again no and i am sure that no english hostess was ever as sporting as frau b who sat there through the long evening presiding at the roulette table and over another little table as well placed at her elbow and supporting the famous beaufle which was the clou of the evening Beuvler is a delicious beverage, a cup composed of spices and Rhine wine of any kind. It is iced, and served in little glasses that the attentive host, rising at intervals, fills for you. It is strong, far stronger than the claret or hock cups of England, and you can get tipsy on it quite nicely. The appearance of Beuvler on the domestic hearth and advertised in restaurants, my Beuvler, Beuvler, in large capitals, scrawled in by the waiter, is said to usher in the spring season in Germany, as the tap-tapping of the drums of the recruits does the autumn. Does not everyone remember the frigid siphon of England? Got in from the chemists round the corner with the garish, unharmonious, coloured paper label denoting the place of its provenance or else the home-made lemonade or barley water for the ladies, the ugly, unattractive whisky bottle of fretted glass that is provided, under protest, as it were, for the men. The ladies, of course, never touch it. A little siphon, please. One hears the murmur as they are putting on their wraps to go. In France, after dinner, there are no drinks at all. There is tea, and there are tisane. There are no droppers in with roulette boards. There are no droppers in at all. By ten o'clock, family life has closed in hopelessly on its unprotesting victims. But Sleepy Hollow is a very good touchstone of domesticity. I wish to put on record my conviction, my knowledge, in fact, and I fancy even Joseph Leopold will let the assertion go unchallenged, that there is no such thing as an easy chair discoverable on the whole continent. On that particular count, England romps in an easy first, and almost spoils my present contention. But no, the true inwardness of the easy chair lies deeper than domesticity. It affects the brain of the three nationalities. Meredith noticed it, he actually made it the criterion of power of English and German brains. English people hardly realise how far George Meredith's genius was a product of his early training, and how his general view was affected by it. He spent a great part of the days of his youth in Germany, and if we read Beecham's career, we can see how that country impressed itself on him. We can observe the results of German scholarship in his style, his style that some people like and others dislike so much, without, however, discovering that it is partially at least a result of his German studies. The quotation I give is from one of our conquerors. Quote, Have the Germans more brains than we English? Unquote. This is the simple question which preoccupies the genius who, like other geniuses, is of no country. He goes on, quote, The comfortable successful have the habit of sitting, and that dulls the brain, more even than it eases the person, ellipsis. The English, their sports, their fierce feastings and their opposition to ideas, and their timidity in regard to change and their execration of criticism, as applied to themselves, are a sign of a prolonged indulgence in the cushioned seat. End of section three.
Chapter Four of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Utopia by Ford Maddox Heffer. Footnote: Utopia refers to the town alluded to in the previous chapter as H. J L F M H. End footnote. Some years ago, I was discussing with a friend, a friend who was celebrated for his building of utopias, what would be the most agreeable form that it would be possible for a country town to take. It was to be a country town which was to be suited for our own living in. It wasn't therefore to be too big, and it wasn't therefore to be industrial. Thirty thousand inhabitants is a good size for such a town. We were thinking rather of Oxford or Cambridge, because Oxford and Cambridge are probably the only towns outside London where there would be enough of lettered society to make living possible in England. So we said we must have a university in our town, not too big or too distinguished a university, because that would make the society of the place altogether too donnish. No, let it be a university founded about the 17th century, so as to have some tradition, but one which has not enormously prospered, so that it may not be overbearing. It ought to have a fairly good university library that, being in correspondence with other university libraries, should be able of itself to supply most of the ordinary books that we needed, and from its correspondence it should be able to supply us with nearly all of the rarest of books upon occasion. Thus, for society, we should have the professors, and on account of the educational centre that the place was, we should have the advantage of the company of various pleasant families who were drawn there by the need for educating their children. In the nature of the case, these would not be persons actively engaged in commercial pursuits. They would be officers on half pay, civil servants in retirement, or colonial governors. Of course, it would be necessary to have a certain sprinkling of the richer industrial classes to pay the town rates. The place might, for instance, be a centre of the cigar-making industry. Cigar factories are not necessarily buildings of an overpowering ugliness, and we must have the town fairly wealthy so as to present a clean, flourishing and spacious aspect. The centre of the town would have to be old, with narrow cobbled streets and high gabled houses. There are, of course, objections to these sins against modernity, but the electric trams will just have to run slowly. And as for sanitation, there will be no need for a dense population in the centre of the town, and we shall gain immensely in corporate and traditional feelings. Of course, we must have a small marketplace with an old gabled town hall. And we must have one or two old white patrician houses. I don't know even that we would not have an old palace, a big rambling erection of ironstone, to remind us of the time when there were patriarchal potentates. Of course, within the town walls, there would not be too many old buildings, even when we are constructing utopias. We have to remember that we exist only by the sufferance of history so that where the 16th century houses have been cleared away, we can't see any particular objection to white square houses of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. They should mostly have green shutters, and all of them stand in fairly large gardens, so that wherever we happen to stand, unless it was actually in the gabled marketplace, we should always see apple boughs pushing round the corners of walls, or mulberry trees rising above low roofs. When it came to the town walls, these would have been swept away some time ago, but we would not have let the space upon which they once stood to be built upon. No, eighty or ninety years ago, we would have had them planted with trees of a fanciful kind, flowering shrubs and grass. So in the hot weather, there would always be a shady walk of pleached limes all round the town, to give us exercise when it was too hot to go farther afield. I think we would be the chief town of the agricultural province in which we dwelt, 
in that way we should have an excellent railway service and we could also have our own courts of justice these buildings of course would have to be outside the town walls you might say that the courts of justice ought to be in the old palace but the old palace is not very adapted for that we want justice to be dispatched as easily and as quickly as possible and we don't want to be stifled when as part of the public we wish to attend a lawsuit so for the palace itself i shall give up one wing to state apartments in case the reigning sovereign should choose to pay us a visit and walk about the town smoking a cigar and the rest of the palace should be given up to part of the garrison and of course we shall have our two lines of electric trams running every seven minutes from the railway station right through the town past the theatre and out to the beginnings of the woods for of course we want a theatre a big finely decorated building with the stage large enough for the production of anything up to parsifal in the theatre there must be a stock company that can play passably well almost any play that we can think of it must be able to give us the merchant of venice and someone else charlie's aunt it must be able to give us a translation of the very latest french comedy as well as mrs warren's profession ibsen's lady from the sea or sudermann's die ehre you may say this is impossible but we are dealing with utopias of course in the summer months when listening to the serious drama is oppressive we should give the stock company a holiday and roving license their places will be taken by a company coming from somewhere else and playing operettas and musical comedies in these seasons when it is sultry the sliding roof will be taken off the theatre the prices for seats will be so small that we could command that every peasant upon the sunday should have not only his fowl in the pot but his pagliacci in the evening and closing our eyes we seem to see ourselves looking upwards from the auditorium of such a theatre and seeing above us the stars and craning over all round the balustrade of the gallery the quaint caps of the peasant women and the three-cornered hats of their husbands of course that too is utopia but we are commanding what we like from an ideal bill of fare let us continue to exhaust the intellectual and artistic sides of our community for two days a week and on sunday afternoons the players would not play and the theatre would be given over to the musical society of the town this musical society would be fairly rich and fairly powerful there would be a musical faculty at the university the local garrison would afford us wind instruments on full dress occasions we could command an orchestra from a neighbouring metropolis we should be able for a night now and then to pay the fees of some really great virtuoso who happened to be touring in that countryside the university could lend us its small aula for chamber concerts the theatre being too large and choral music we could raise about five hundred voices from the town and its surroundings choral music would be rendered in the great collegiate church where there would be a fine organ for the fine arts we would set aside a largish gallery where the collections of pictures would be changed every two months at times we would outrage the townsmen with loan collections of post impressionists at times we would tickle their vanity and their interests by collections of pictures representing the scenery and history of the neighbourhood now and again with a special effort we would get together some rembrandts or a collection representing the english school up to eighteen twenty we should of course have an excellent museum of local archaeology the university itself would look after stuffed animals probably three or four cinematograph theatres would spring up in the place and we should have nothing against them and there would have to be say half a dozen cafes where one could drink anything from chocolate to cocktails listen to small orchestras and read the foreign newspapers there would have to be also at least four open-air restaurants 
one in each wind quarter amongst the woods that surrounded the valley in which the town lay. The town itself, I think, ought to be in a broad grass valley, because we want a river for boating, and river meadows where the washerwomen can lay out the linen on the grass. Near the town there should be a couple of old castles standing high on pyramids of basalt. These would remind us of the times when robber barons kept the town under, before the benevolent potentates of the old palace unified and civilised the country. They would also give us pleasant places to which to make excursions. In the valley itself we would have a very rich peasantry, so that whenever we stood anywhere upon a little hill we could see the great stretches of rich pleasant country with a large number of little villages, twenty or thirty little villages with red roofs and the bulbous leaden spires of churches and the stalks flying down to the streams and the woods covering all the hillsides. And of course as we were the chief town of the province we should have large hospitals but very large hospitals with the most modern equipments. Naturally these will be attached to the university and naturally the university would have for its professors one or two of the finest surgeons in Europe and one or two of the finest physicians. This would make us feel infinitely safer in our utopian country town. Of course such a town is impossible. It is unthinkable and yet from this town we are writing. Yes, there isn't the least doubt of it. Once we may have lived in Arcady, now we live in Utopia. There isn't a single thing missing of all the things that we have catalogued. The theatre is there, and the university library, and the musical society, and the companies, and the peasants who go to the opera, and the electric tramways, and the palace, and the hospital. There are even seven booksellers' shops of the first class, whereas in London you cannot find one bookseller of the first class in the whole of the western suburbs. So that when you come to think of it, we are living in Utopia. Yet in high Germany, the town of which we are citizens passes for a very miserable little nest, and the town rates are not as high as they are in any English village. It is odd. We are living in Utopia. We are living in an earthly paradise. There can't be any doubt of it. But just at this moment, a man comes in and tells us that the washing will not be home till tomorrow morning. And we become frenzied with rage. We say that we will break the neck of this excellent and long-suffering valet if he does not get all our collars back by three o'clock. Yes. We are all citizens of an earthly paradise, but if we may be permitted the expression, we will be damned if we do not leave by the 6-9 for London. End of section 4